Hallelujah. Well, again, as I said, what a, what a treat to be back with you. Boy, we enjoy, enjoy coming here, enjoy uh, seeing you all, and, and uh, great opportunity just to, just to enjoy. I, I, maybe you are like me, and uh, I, uh, that, that time during COVID when we couldn't meet together, what a, what a horrible thing that was. And uh, it is so good to be back together uh, with you and uh, uh, with friends and uh, together worshiping God. You know, it's yeah, we can sing to the radio in the car or in the shower or any, anybody else a great shower worshiper? Anybody? Uh, uh, some of you are brave enough to admit that. The, uh, we, can, we can do all of that, and that's wonderful, and that's appropriate that we do that, that we sing out and uh, worship God all the time, right? But how much better to come together with the family of God and uh, worship God together. What a, what a treat to worship God together with you this morning. Hallelujah. I uh, just want to say thank you to your pastors uh, for giving us this opportunity. God bless you guys. I hope you have a, a nice time with family. And uh, um, I know your church will be eager to have you back when you're, when you're back. But... Uh, uh, we're thankful to be here. My wife and I, my wife Julie and I are U.S. missionaries, and we are. She usually does this part of of our presentation, and so forgive me if I'm uh, somewhat lost in all of this because she she care. I tell her, honey, you've been you've been carrying me for 34, 35 years now. Don't stop now. What am I going to do if if you're not around? And uh, um, so, but at camp. She caught a cold. We both did. I just got over mine quicker than, than she did. So uh, uh, she's, uh, it's, she's recovering, and uh, so that's, that's good. We're thankful for that. But uh, her voice has not gotten the memo yet on that. So uh, uh, she, she said, well, you're, you're going to have to introduce what we do. So here goes. We are U.S. missionaries, and uh, we're missionaries to pastors. And, and what we try to do is, I told that to somebody and, and just left it at that. And they said, well, there's a lot of them that need it. And uh, <laughs> no, uh, what, what we try to do is connect with pastors and, and just uh, remind them, let them know, hey, you're not alone. We're here, we're here with you. We're here for you. Uh, and we're praying for you and believing God for great things. So, so often uh, for pastors, it is, it is very easy to, to feel kind of, insulated or isolated from people and and uh, uh, so often the to-do list gets longer than the done list and and uh, it, it just it's nice to have somebody come alongside and say what what can we do to be a help and when we started honestly I thought because we like doing projects and and we like helping out with things like that and I thought that that would be a big part of what we do and it is a part of what we do we, uh, we, we kind of talked about our, our ministry as projects, prayer, and pastoral care. Um, but projects, uh, uh, pastors don't, don't want projects as much as they just want a friend. And so we just try to be friends with pastors and uh, connect with them. Maybe it'll be over, over a coffee. Maybe it'll be around a campfire. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, uh, the opportunity. In fact, we had that opportunity at, at family camp. We were with a number of pastors, and uh, some, some friends of ours who were there looked, and they said, well, we looked around, and there was four or five sets of pastors around the campfire, and we weren't pastors. We were wondering if maybe we needed to, to go get our pastor card to come back and sit around the campfire, which is not at all true, but uh, we, we, just, we just love people, and we love pastors. Both my wife and I grew up in pastors' homes. Our dads were pastors, and, and uh, so we kind of had that as as a background, and then we became pastors ourselves and uh, pastored for uh, 30 years or so, and, and uh, um, now we do this. And uh, we, we saw firsthand just the, the needs that pastors have and the opportunities that there were to bless pastors. So I just want to encourage you, bless your pastors. Bless your pastors. Every chance you get, Bless them. They need it. I, I, I just and and they didn't they didn't tell me to say this, but I know from personal experience it's true. They need it. They need to he, they need to hear it. You know, you probably heard that that joke of the 
the, uh, the wife told her husband, honey, how come, how come you never tell me that you, that you love me? He said, well, sweetheart, I, I said it 50 years ago when we got married. If it ever changes, I'll let you know. And uh, uh, sometimes we think that way with pastors. And we tell, well, we, we let our pastors know. You know, we tell them every October. And during Pastor Appreciation Month, we tell them, hey, we appreciate you. But you know what? They really need to hear it more than just once a year, don't they? And so I just want to encourage you. Be an encouragement and a blessing to your pastor. And so that's what we, that's what we try to do. Uh, it, we try to be a help to pastors and an encouragement to them. And I, Did I cover everything? Did I get everything? Okay, it's, it's all right. I got a thumbs up. That's good. Uh, I, I'd encourage you uh, as, as you're leaving uh, this, this the, be, uh, I was going to say this afternoon, and I thought, no, you know what, that might scare some people right then and there, and they might just leave. Uh, we'll be done before noon, Lord willing. But uh, uh, when, as you leave, we have some prayer cards out in the back. I'd encourage you, pick one of those up. We, we uh, desperately covet your prayers. And growing up in church, I used to hear pastors say, you know, here's our prayer card. Please pray for us. And, 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 and if, you're, if you're able, if you could consider uh, supporting us on a monthly basis, that would be great. And I, and I want to say all of those things as well. But I, I used to think, yeah, yeah, yeah. They want you to take the prayer card. But what they really want is the monthly support. You know? But now that we're missionaries, I realize... What they really meant is, please take a prayer card and pray for us. We desperately need your prayers. And so, uh, uh, and encourage you to, to uh, uh, post that somewhere prominently. Uh, and uh, 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 every time you see it, uh, pray for us if you would. We, we need your prayers. And, and, and if you can support us, wonderful, but please pray for us. Also out there on the table is a, a newsletter. It's from the beginning of the year, but if you want to know what we've done from the beginning of the year till now, we'll tell you. And uh, so just ask. Praise God. Well, today we're going to be looking at Joshua. Our text is in Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to be looking uh, at, at verses 10 through 12. I'm going to scoot this over just a little bit or I know I'm going to trip on this. I was so happy when they gave me a lapel mic because... My family is Italian, and, and if I have to, if I can only use one hand when I'm preaching, it'll take me twice as long. And uh, I, I need both hands free. I just hope I don't uh, knock Pastor Gary's microphone flying here. But anyway, Joshua chapter 5, beginning at verse 10, it says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. Lord God, help us as your children as your people, as, your, as, as believers in you, to be people who are eating the produce of the promised land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I pray that the tr that truth would sink into our hearts today. Help us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. I, I love this portion of Scripture. And uh, it, it, it would be so easy to miss this, right? So easy to miss this phrase. I want us to catch this, this phrase. Eating the food of Canaan. Eating the produce of Canaan. Um, it would it, be easy to miss the significance of this huge transition in the lives of the Israelites. Uh, most of us like some variety in our diet, but... Can you imagine the excitement of the children of Israel after 40 years? 40 years! They've been eating almost nothing besides manna and quail. Manna and quail. Manna and quail. I've never had manna, um, but I, I, they say that it's wonderful. I, I don't know who has had manna. I, I, I don't know anybody, but uh, somebody tried to describe it, and, and supposedly it has a taste like honey. 
that person was a lot older than I thought they were when they described that to me. I, I can't imagine that. Because I don't know that we have anything. We don't have manna around anymore. But they said, no. I, I, and one commentator uh, that I read, they said it tastes tasted a little bit like honey, like kind of a sweet bread. Again, I have no idea how they knew that that's, that they, that that's what it tastes like. But it sounds good, right? You know, like maybe one of those Hawaiian rolls, and, uh, and those, those are good. Or, or when you get a, like a, a yeast roll and, and you, you put uh, honey butter on it. Oh, that's good. I love that. But I don't want that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For 40 years? 40 years? Can you imagine? Wow! Talk about stuck in a rut. Uh, and, and, then, and then they could spice it up with quail. But the Bible says they, they got so much quail, they were sick of quail. They got sick of quail after just a short time, which I believe. I totally believe it. I can, I can totally see that. I like quail, but... Not for 40 years. And not manna for 40 years. Can you imagine how excited they were? when they got Some of them, for the very first time, all they'd ever had was manna and quail. Manna and quail. Manna and quail. Manna and quail. What's on the menu? Manna. What's on the menu? Quail. What's on the menu? Manna and quail. Some of them had never had anything other than manna and quail their whole lives. And now they get to eat the produce of Canaan. The produce of of the promised land. Wow, I can't imagine the excitement. I'm sure manna was good because it came from God, but it wasn't the food of Canaan. It wasn't the food of promise. It wasn't the best that God had for them. A lot of times people say uh, at, at sporting events, you know, if, if they're playing, I don't know if you guys have a church league softball team, but uh, we used to have a church league softball team. One of the things that people, would, somebody would say it every single year, I didn't, but uh, other people would say it. They'd say, "Well, you know what? Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not about winning or losing. Uh, we're just out here to have fun." I I've done both. Okay, I've I've won and I'm lo- and I've lost. But I got to tell you, winning is a lot more fun. Okay. Winning is a lot better. Now, I, I try not to be a poor sport when I lose. Uh, my wife and I, does anybody else play phase 10? It, nobody can see your hand on, online, so they won't know if, if you're a bad person for playing phase 10, all right? But uh, I, I, I'll raise my hand. Uh, my wife and I play, play uh, phase 10 at times, and she beats me like 90% of the time. I, I, I must be the... I, I don't know, either she's an amazing uh, phase 10 player or I'm the worst phase 10 player on the planet because she, she beats me over and over and over again. It's just, it's just kind of a normal thing for us. She wins, I lose. But I got to tell you, and, and I try to be a good sport when I, when I lose, all right? But winning is a whole lot better. Winning, when I get to do that dance around the dining room table and just celebrate and say, ha, lose! No, I don't, I don't do that. I don't, I don't do that. Uh, but winning is a whole lot better than losing, right? Uh, and uh, so but the point I'm trying to make is manna was probably good, right? But eating the produce of the promised land had to have been infinitely better. And that's what I want us to catch today. Uh, what does that mean to us? What does it mean for us to eat the food of Canaan? What does that look like for us? Uh, number one, it means that it's time to come out of the wilderness. Okay? When we apply this portion of Scripture to ourselves here, I believe that, that, that for the children of Israel, it was time for them to come out of the wilderness and into the promise that God had for them. Remember they tried to do this 40 years before? And everybody said, no, 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 we look like grasshoppers, we're scared, there's big people there, this is the, we don't want to do this, we don't want to go into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb and Moses, and they almost killed those three guys for saying, no, we can do it, God's with us. God said, no, you guys don't, the guys that, the the ten spies that went in and said, no, 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 there's giants in the land, he said, all right, you guys are going to wander around in the desert for 40 more years until this whole generation passes away, except for Joshua and Caleb. 
praise God. Uh, uh, it, and, and so coming out of the wilderness in, into the promised land, this is an important thing for us to get a hold of um, and, and to apply to our own lives. The wilderness represents stuff, and it's all bad stuff. Okay, uh, The wilderness represents dryness. The wilderness represents disobedience. The wilderness represents lostness. Did anybody else... Does anybody else in your Bible, do you have a, a, um, a, a, a picture of, of Sinai, the, the wilderness, that, that, a map of that, that shows the wanderings of the children of Israel for 40 years? You know, how they kind of circle around. And I had one of those in my Bible as a kid, and I remember asking my dad, well, why didn't they just go straight up there? Why? I, couldn't, I couldn't understand why they would do it. Because you watch it, and it circles around, and we don't know the exact route, Okay. But there's some landmarks that we get that, that we know, okay, well, they, we know they were here, and then later on they were here. So we kind of get a little bit, we can kind of fill in those dots, connect some of those dots, but they just wander around and around in the wilderness. They, they, they were still following God, but they had to follow, and, and they didn't know where they were. God knew where, they, where he was taking them, and he knew it wasn't the promised land yet. Okay, So the wilderness represents being lost. The wilderness represents immaturity. The wilderness represents rebellion. Right, God, we're not going to do it your way. I know you've called us to go into this thing. I know you've called us to take this land, but we're not going to do it your way. We're going to do it our way. Man. The wilderness represents grumbling and complaining. The wilderness represents limited opportunities. I want to challenge you today, don't get comfortable in the wilderness. It can be a habit. Now, we all go through times in our lives when we feel dry, or we feel lost, or we feel like, hey, I'm a little immature, I need to grow up in this area. Uh, there's all, we've all had those times of grumbling and complaining, all right? But this can become a habit. When we get comfortable in the wilderness, it can become a habit for us. It can become normal for us. What if the children of Israel had thought of themselves only as wilderness wanderers? Well, we're just, we're just, this is, this is who we are. This is just who we are. We're just, we're just those kind of people that wander in the wilderness, you know, we just kind of, Go here, and then we go over here, and then just wander over here. And then this is just who we are. We don't really have any anywhere where we belong. We don't really have a goal. We don't really know what God's plan is. We're just kind of wandering in the. What if they'd have thought that that was all there was? What if they'd have got that in their minds and in their hearts that that's who they were called to be? Their parents had thought of themselves only as slaves. And they continually rebelled and begged to go back to Egypt. Remember, telling, remember them telling Moses? It was better. Are, are there no graves in Egypt? You had to bring us out here to the wilderness to die? We could have died happy as slaves. They weren't happy there either. But that's all, that's all they thought of themselves. We're just slaves. We're just slaves. What if this generation had thought, well, we're just wilderness wanderers? Never allow defeat or wilderness to define you. You were made for something more. You were made to be a child of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I know that one snuck up on you and you didn't have the chance to shout hallelujah on that or, or amen or praise God or anything like that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again so you get that opportunity, okay? Because I, I, that one just went right on by. So here we go. We're going to do it again. You ready? Everybody ready? You were made to be a child of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's good news. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 16. For you did not receive the spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with your spirit that we are God's children. That's almost worth getting excited about, isn't it? Man, we are God's children. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, the very next verse. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs with God. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His suffering, in order that we may also share in His glory. Praise God. God's promises are for you. God's standards are for you. God's best is for you. Getting comfortable in the wilderness will keep us from entering into all of the things that God has for us. Church, we can't get comfortable in the wilderness. We can't get comfortable in the wilderness. We can't. God has. Let me give you some specifics on this, okay? God has healed some of you from things. But that thing has defined you for so long, you're stuck on that thing. I just want you to know today you're healed. You don't have to stay in the wilderness anymore. You don't have to hang on to that thing anymore. God has, God has healed not just your physical bodies, but your minds. He's healed your mind. Some of, some of you have battled depression or fear, anxiety, whatever it may be. Unforgiveness. Uh, unforgiveness. That was a huge one for me. Huge. I'm not a person of unforgiveness. I'm a person of forgiveness because God has set me free from that. And I don't have to stay in the wilderness of unforgiveness anymore. If God has set you free from something, be free. Be free. Go into the promised land. Enjoy the produce. Enjoy everything that God has for you. He set you free. Don't let the wilderness define you. Don't let those things that, that you used to be had a wonderful... Uh, uh, this sounds contradictory, okay? But uh, is, a, is a Christian blues album. All right? I know, that sounds contradictory, right? We, as, as Christians, we, we, can't, we can't ever have the blues. But... Uh, um, but one of, the, one of the songs on there, it says, things that I used to would do, I don't do no more. One of the verses is, lies that I used to would tell, I don't tell no more. One of the verses says, people that I used to would hate, I don't hate no more. Praise God. Why? Because we've come out of the wilderness into the promised land. The wilderness doesn't define you. Those things that you were, those things that you did, those thoughts that you thought before Christ don't define you. Jesus has made you a co-heir with Him. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those things don't define you anymore. You are free. Don't let the wilderness define you. Don't let the wilderness uh, keep you from entering into everything that God has for you. Um, so, it means we've got to come out of the wilderness. It means that it's time for us to grow up. You see, the food of Canaan makes us hungry and thirsty for more. When we have a little bit of the food of Canaan, we go, hmm, this is, this is pretty good. Didn't melt in my mouth kind of the way manna did, but wow, this is good. I like this. I want more of this. When I was a student at North Central, I had the opportunity, because I was a missions major, had the opportunity to participate in their studies abroad program. And there was two options in the studies abroad program. One was going to Continental Bible College in Brussels, Belgium. I'd taken some French in high school, and I told Brother Fally, the, the department uh, chairman, the department head, I said, Brother Fally, I, I, just, I think I would be great in Brussels, and I'd really like to go to Brussels. And, and, I, and I made my pitch to him, you know, and told him how awesome it would be to be in Brussels and how I needed to be the one student that they were going to be sending to Brussels that semester. He said, okay, well, I'll think about it. Next day he let me know I was going to El Salvador instead of Brussels. <laughs> oh, man. Right. As it turned out, he was right. I was wrong. I loved El Salvador, and, and God did great things in my heart in El Salvador. But one of the dishes that they had in El Salvador, um, and maybe, maybe you've heard of it, it's, a, it's very popular down there, uh, is called Chuco. Anyone? Chuco? No? No, no one here has heard of Chuco. <laughs> You've heard of Chuco. Oh, that's awesome. I, I'm told that Chuco is kind of a slang for dirty uh, and, uh, or, or 
dirt because it looks like mud in a cup. And uh, in fact, I called it choco, not chuco, because uh, I'll tell you what it is, okay? And, and now, I mean, we're several years removed from my time in El Salvador. And thinking back, on it, I think, well, I shouldn't have tasted as nasty as it did. How, how did I not? I, I don't know how I didn't like it, but here's what it was. Cornmeal, you know, with, with kind of, kind of a, a cornmeal slurry, it was like a, it was like a cornmeal smoothie, okay? Um, and, uh, and then they would, uh, in a cup, and then they would take a scoop of beans and put, I mean, I like cornbread, you know, so I, you'd think that I would like this. And then, and then beans, my dad was from South Texas. We had beans growing up, you know, he'd make, make a big pot of beans and we'd have that for meals. But they'd take a scoop of beans and then they'd put a couple of drops of uh, Tabasco sauce on it. And somehow, those ingredients coming together like that is the worst thing you can ever imagine putting into your mouth. And it was just, it was, it was terrible. And um, we would go to the Chucaria. It was kind of like a little fast food place, only you'd sit there, you'd get, you'd get your chuco really fast because it doesn't take them long to, to make that. And then they'd sit there and talk. I, I have a feeling they didn't like it either because it took them an hour or two to eat that one little cup of chuco. I, they must not have liked it either, but it was terrible. It was terrible. Just give me the real dirt. I'll take the real dirt instead and eat that, and you can, you can keep your chuco. I think that the real dirt would have tasted better. Um, needless to say, I didn't ever want seconds of chuco. Never. Now there's other things that I want seconds of every time. Shrimp. Oh, man. I love shrimp. I love it when Red Lobster does the all-you-can-eat shrimp. I am up for this challenge. I am ready to go. All right? I love shrimp. I, I like uh, Pizza Ranch. Not everybody likes Pizza Ranch, but I, I do. I, I love it. I, I, I'll, go, I'll keep going until they say, no, you can't have any more. Go sit down. That's enough. You've had enough. Uh, I love I love. There's a lot of things I want seconds on. Chuko was not one of those things. All right? but, but the food of Canaan, the food of Canaan brings us to where God wants us to be, and that's a place of maturity. A place of maturity. Uh, and, and, and we should want seconds on this. This should be something that we want more of. A place of maturity. We are called to grow up in God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19-16 through 16 tells us that God gave us, talking to the church, God gave us, the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? So that we'll grow up. God wants us to grow up. God expects us to grow up. And when we talk about the food of promise, the food of the promised land, that's the food that the things that God wants us to have so that we will grow up in Him spiritually. This is this because when we grow up, we grow from a place of, 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 of not being useful. I'm, I'm just gonna say it uselessness, right? Is it, do you remember when, when, when Paul writes uh, Philemon and says, hey, now I'm sending you back Onesimus. He, he's, he's, uh, he was a slave to you. His name used to be useless. All right? Can you imagine having that for your name? But now he's going to be useful. I'm sending him back not as a slave, but as a brother. And he's going to be useful to you and to me. Why was, why was Onesimus useful? Because he'd grown up. See, he, he'd run away from his master. We don't know. Maybe Philemon was treating him bad. Maybe he just didn't, didn't want to be a slave anymore. I, I can understand that. That makes sense to me. But uh, he, for whatever reason, he left. And Paul says, I'm sending him back now as a brother. All right? He's been with us for a while. He's grown up. 
and I'm sending him back to you as a brother, and he's going to be useful to you. When we grow up, we know when we've grown up because we become useful. Okay? And that's what the, the food of promise, the thing that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives is to help us grow up so that we can become useful. Praise God. Maturity brings usefulness to us. Maturity uh, enables us to bring life and strength and health to the people around us. When our kids were little, man, we had to help them. We had to do for them. We had to, one of our, one of our daughter, our middle daughter, this was every, almost, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, just a little bit, but almost every Sunday, I can't find my shoes anywhere. I've looked everywhere. I can't find it. Every Sunday morning, we would have that meltdown. All right, my wonderful wife would say, "Honey, look down." She'd look down, and there would be her, her shoes sitting just right by her there, uh, uh, wherever she was, you know, in the middle of the living room or dining room or wherever she chose to have her meltdown that Sunday morning. There would be her shoes. She'd go, oh, there they are. And then she was, we had to do for them. We had to make sure they had clothes, make sure they had food, make sure they had a place. But guess what? All of our kids are grown up now. And they do for themselves. They fix their own ones. They take care of themselves. They wash their own clothes. I hope they do. Uh, they uh, they uh, take care of themselves. They don't have to be told those things anymore. They do those things, and they are useful, and they are a blessing, and not just to us, but to people around them. Praise God. Praise God. That's what God wants for us. And that when we eat the food of Canaan, we grow up. We begin to grow up. One, one more thing before we close. Eating the food of Canaan means that now it's time to conquer. See, the food of Canaan prepares us for victory. When you tasted victory, you can't be happy with less. That's why I always had such a struggle with that saying, well, you know, it's not about winning or losing. It's just, let's just go out and have fun. Man, winning is fun. Winning is fun. And eating the food of Canaan prepares us for victory. It, it gets us ready for that. For, you see, from this place, from this time when they began to eat the food of Canaan, they went on to Jericho. That was their next stop. And remember what happens at Jericho? They march around, march around, march around, march around, march around. The walls come down, they go in. That is the beginning of taking the land. Hallelujah. And so they, they e eating the food of Canaan means that it's time to conquer. When you've tasted victory, you can't be happy with anything else. And God has victory waiting for us, church. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 3, God makes this awesome promise to Joshua and the children of Israel. And, and I just would encourage you, I, I encourage you to jot that down somewhere. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. Because I want this to be a verse that, that you begin to meditate on, okay? You just, you just chew, chew on this. Let, this. let God make this promise alive for you, all right? We, so, you know, we, we talk about meditating in, in, in Christians. I, I think a lot of times med, meditation for a Christian is just, it's just chewing on something. It's just kind of letting it soak into our hearts and to our lives. Look at this promise that God gives to Joshua. He says, I will give you every place, everywhere that you set your foot. Just like I promised Moses, I'm going to do that for you. Praise God. Praise God. I want to encourage you, church, claim that promise. God, I'm believing you for victory in my family. Claim that promise. Claim this promise right here from Joshua 1.3. God, you're giving me every place I set my foot. I'm just, I'm just marching around my family in prayer. Marching around them. God, they're yours. They're, gonna, they're, they're living for you. They're serving you. God, you're doing great things in our hearts. Claim your workplace for Christ. Claim your neighborhood. Claim your community for Christ and begin to have that impact. You're, you're getting a taste of the food from Canaan, church. You, you can't be satisfied with anything less. 
You won't taste victory if you're wandering around in the wilderness. You won't eat the fruit of Canaan wandering around in the wilderness. You must conquer the promised land. You will only receive God's promise by stepping out in faith and obedience to God. Hallelujah. We only get to enjoy the fruit of Canaan by leaving the wilderness and going into the place God has called us, doing the things that God has called us to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now the children of Israel, now that they've tasted the food of the land, they would be crazy to turn around and go back into the wilderness, wouldn't they? They'd be crazy to do that. They want more, and God has more for them. I want you to know that God has more for you as well. Hallelujah. Listen, all the things you've tasted so far, they're just appetizers. They're just appetizers. God's buffet line isn't running out. Okay, You're not getting to the end of it. It just keeps going and going and getting better and better and better. The Bible talks about going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. It's because God doesn't run out of glory. God doesn't run out of victory for us. God doesn't run out of the food of Canaan. It just keeps getting better and better and better. God has more for us as well. The things that we've tasted so far, they're just appetizers. The main course is yet to come. More victory, greater victory is yet to come. Greater challenges are yet to come. But we don't have to turn around from them and run back into the desert. Let's go into the promised land and feast on the food of Canaan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and... You'd say, uh, Pastor Bill, I, I just, I just need. I, I know God has given me deliverance in this area. Or I know God has given me victory in this area. Or I know God has done this or that for me in in this area. But I, I just, I'm not, I'm not. I haven't received it fully yet. I just want to encourage you. Let let today be the day. Okay, let today be the day for you. And, and so, uh, as we, we're going to sing this song one more time, uh, just the chorus of worthy of it all. And as we begin to praise God again in song, um, I, just, I just want you to say, Lord, you're, you're worthy of all the praise and all the glory because you've already won the victory for me. Hallelujah. Uh, the Bible says that we are God's workmanship. This is one of my favorite verses. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And, and this is the part that we forget. That God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, God has already prepared the challenge, the good works. That He's already prepared the promised land for you. It's already prepared in advance. But guess what? He's already prepared the victory celebration for you as well as you go in, as you move into the promised land. And so, if you'd say, like, Pastor, I just haven't seen that victory yet, but I want to. But as we, as we sing this song, you just receive that victory this morning, will you? Say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm gonna, those things that you've promised me, I'm, I'm going to receive them in Jesus' name, and I'm going to have the victory. In Jesus' name. If you've never come into a relationship uh, with God through Jesus, I would love to pray with you. But it, it, you, you can pray right there where you're at, but I would, I would love to hear about it and just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Thank you. You inside. I want to live for you each and every day, turning my back on the wilderness, and I'm going into the promised land that you have for me. And uh, um, if you pray that prayer this morning, whether it's uh, online, if you're listening on, online, or, or if you're here and you pray that prayer, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. The church would love to hear about it. Pastor Gary would love to hear about it and celebrate with you. But uh, let's, let's sing this song, You're Worthy of It All.